the dark cosmos. Stay cosmic. November, the 3rd of 2469. Ben Dawson reporting in on this log. It's day 72 on planet HK617. The weather has been constant, so that's been good. The approaching storm is going to be a problem 10 days from now, but I expect the exterior of the ship to hold up. The only problem would be food, because I don't know how long that storm is going to go on within this area. Storms usually last months, so it'll be interesting to see how I'm going to get through this, much less be rescued. I'm not sure if this is going to be my last log, but I'm trying to keep positive, even as everything seems to be closing in on me. It's hard. I thought I could get through this, but... I don't know anymore. I don't know. A beep clicked as that log ended. I stared at the control panel with my fingers tapping soundlessly against the clean metallic sheen of the surface. There was a blinking indicator from the communication relay that was probably an unread message from my control centre. I did not care about their messages, or what they wanted to tell me. The only thing I cared about was getting off this planet. Talking to them was not going to make me feel any better. For now, all I had was time. A lot of it. I should have gotten up from my chair and done any of my scheduled tasks. That was not only because they kept me sane, but because I was the only one here, so if I didn't do them, then who would? Space exploration was always a team effort, and I was starting to learn that lesson the hard way. If I didn't maintain the water channels, I was going to be drinking my own sweat soon enough. I had to clip the climbing vines from around the ship to prevent them from being absorbed by this godforsaken planet. My daily hunting gave me some food and also kept me fit in a place that sucked me drier than a bag of chips. I hated the situation. It would be so much easier to just lie back and just let this planet take me. I could easily be absorbed within this planet's reaching vines and become a part of it. A thud shook me out of my seat and made me grab the makeshift spear I crafted. I glared at the scanners and saw nothing on its surveillance. My back arched as I sat forward. I knew I was being ridiculous holding onto my spear. It was not like there was anything that could get inside the spaceship. As my eyes looked over the communication relay and the scanners, a flash of colour betrayed my newfound enthusiasm. I clicked on the display for the cameras. There were many cameras around the spaceship and they barely caught the blur that swept past the images in front of me. Even then, I still caught sight of those grey claws, hairless, pasty skin and white porcelain irises. I was not sure if it was from a nightmarish memory or my well-tuned instincts, but it was definitely that beast. The Barrio. That's what Denise called it when we first interacted with it. Then it went on to kill Denise and the rest of my teammates, leaving me alone on this moss-infested rock. These beasts were making an effort to keep track of my location, and giving me a subtle reminder that I was on their territory. This was not how I expected my trip to this place to turn out. I thought I would come here to collect some samples, make some discoveries, and come home as one of the many space heroes immortalised into history. That was what I hoped, anyway. I continued to watch the surveillance, but it did not appear until its cold, ugly face appeared before camera number two. It stared right at the camera. Or was it staring at me? It was an unshakable fear I could not defeat as it peered into my unseeable soul. My fingers curled tighter around the spear as the barrio twitched. The camera blacked out. What happened? 
my lips parted in confusion. Then the barrio moved in front of another camera feed, which it glared straight into this one. It blacked out as well. That was two cameras down now. What the hell was going on? It took me a while to realise that the barrio was taking out the cameras. I was blind. It took this beast more than two months, but it finally figured out a new thing and made sure I had no advantage over it. My shoulders tensed with the weight of dread my life carried now. What kind of catastrophe was this that I was facing up against? This beast was not going to scare me. I survived this long, and I was going to make sure I lived through this situation. My cold body was not going to lay on this accursed planet. I could not see the barrio anymore, but it was not like it could bash its way in, and it probably would have if it was a little bigger and stronger. A barrio was the size of an ox, with a barbed tail worthy of murder. It was a terrible, monstrous beast, and I hoped I would never see it again face to face. The estimated time they gave me until they got a ship to my location was going to be another month. Even then I should have been able to leave with the ship, but I couldn't, thanks to the damage the barrios caused. They did not attack the wings or the walls of the ship, they just damaged the engine flaps and dug up dirt around the ship. That told me one significant thing. They knew what a spaceship was, and they knew it was my only escape off this planet. They knew how to dismantle it and disable it. That was a frightening thought. Intelligent life. As much as I wanted to assume it was just lucky of them to figure it out, they figured it out too quickly. We always interacted with many creatures on the planets that we investigated, and they all had a variable degree of intelligence. The barrio surpassed anything we knew before. Soon enough, the sun dropped behind the tree line, and I was able to exit this ship. The plants I grew on the ship were not going to help me right now. They would take forever to bear fruit, and that assumed I was going to stay here that long. But, considering how things were going wrong, a part of me prepared for the possibility that I would be here for a very long time. It was a feeling that I could not shake. I tried to be positive, but it was getting harder the further I travelled from my ship. When we arrived here, we were only out in the field for one day before it attacked. My mind did not want to go back to that day, and the terrible long hours I was stuck in a tree trying to avoid its merciless claws. The only good solace was that it was never out at night, but the darkness that this planet delved into was a whole other problem. Because of the orbit this planet had with its sun, nighttime lasted anywhere from four to five days at a time. That gave me a good enough time to hunt. The barrio would never attack me at night, but I was no fool, for he was not the only predator on this planet. I stepped out of my ship with my spear slung over my shoulder, turned on the torch on my wrist guard, and looked around. My breath caught as the reading started spiking. This planet had a toxic and acidic atmosphere. That toxicity left droplets of its whimsical nature upon the glass screen of my helmet, the moisture of this place was always an annoyance that deterred my enthusiasm. Even the ship was being affected by the loaded moisture, as the once clean white sheen of the ship's surface was now a dirty brine of grey dirt. Blue moss grew at the edges of the coffin the burrows dug it in. This spaceship was useless now, and if I did not escape here, my own sarcophagus. I could not die here. I needed to survive, so I moved forward into the unknown. It was stuffy being here for too long, and that was the least of my worries once I came out into the planet's darkened ambience. The only lights were the trees with their water fruits. These fruits were the size of a house, but shined in the darkness with a golden luster. I walked under these and many other vegetation, trying to find some animals to kill. This planet was weirder at night. 
It was like this place was different. The vines laid there deader than nails, and the earth did not sparkle with its hidden gems. My boots would crunch into the dried earth, compared to the morning which was softer than a child's touch. My suit's readings were chaotic on this trip. I froze when vibrations hit the soles of my feet from afar. Something was close, and based on the might of those vibrations, it was not a small thing either. A part of me felt like the moment the planet was out of the sun's blazing sight, something changed. The atmospheric pressure and temperature readings told me that. On top of that, the storm readings were definitely worse at night. I would have to go out into that storm, and I was not looking forward to that. It was like during the daytime everything was alive, but during the night the place was dead. A deep groan echoed throughout the forest. It got weirder when I sidestepped behind a tree and watched a 50-foot reptile, akin to our dinosaurs, stomp across the valley in front of me. This planet was just like Earth in its early years. It was at the cradle of life, and it was beautiful to see. My best option for food was the plant life around here. When we came here, we did not have a lot of information on the various fruits on this planet. I had to learn quickly what was good to eat and what was poisonous. What I did was watch the many herbivores of this planet. The fruits they ate gave me a rough idea of what to try out. Plus, I only started out with tiny portions for some leaves and fruits at first, and watched my conditions to see if they made me sick. Only one plant I ate the nuts of made me sick so far, so I had been lucky. The first month I mostly ate meat I hunted, which was harder to get. That month was rough and uncompromising to my stomach's sensibilities. My best method to get that meat was to lay traps, since my ability to hunt on foot was non-existent. The one time I wished I became a boy scout and learned some of that survival nonsense. My ability to lay traps was not good either, but I learned with each failure. There was one thing that was odd though. I neared the snare I set up. From the rope I made out of vines to the metal I crafted around a spiked wedge, all of it was beset by rust and moss overgrowth. Parts of the metal were cracked and bent into odd curvature, as if morphed by an unknown force of gravity. It was metal that was supposed to be unaffected by rust. How high was the acidity of this place to do this form of violence to it? Distant crittering chirps woke me from my focus on the trap's condition. What mattered was its performance, and it caught nothing, even though it was tripped. A splash of blood lined the spines that threatened to kill any small creature. I would have to check another trap to see. The featherless birds flew over the descending fog that cut into the tree line. I was unable to get anything in those traps, so I set new ones in different locations. After I gathered some fruits into my pack, I went back to my home base. Three days of gathering fruits and little rest kept me high on this survival campaign. My feet got unsteady as the arid surface got more uneven. Here, a lot of logs hung in the strength of the vines that crossed ten feet above me. The few logs lined the ground with enough moss over it to stake claim to its new possession. I almost stepped over the log until a creak made me stop. Was I imagining that? My head moved over the log to see the long body of a gigantic snake curling beside the log like water along the sandy banks. Where was the head? I looked on either side of the log and saw how long this slimy body stretched past the log's dry roots. It was probably best to not find out. I stepped back and walked around it, which led me up a hillside. This patch of the land was filled with more ground foliage and a prettier presentation of the flower culture. The colours of this display were bright against the darkening sky. A small mammal moved through a column of bushes and popped its head out of a trinket of red flowers. The fur was brown and its eyes were big and bold. Such a cuddly creature had to die at my hands. It was almost sad. Almost. My fingers tightened around the spear before I swung it. 
The spear went right through the trinket, but the animal ran off unharmed. I frowned and looked around with a sense of foreboding hanging in the air. I walked down a low-rising cliff and into a ridge. The grass here smacked against my knees as I stepped through the depths of the darkness. Lights beamed at me from a distance and my eyes sparkled from each intermittent blink. I froze when the wind picked up and shook the bushes to its melody. The lights dimmed as the ground shook again. Those tremors were closer this time. I listened and my heartbeat pounded in my head worse than any conundrum I ever faced in the past. My eyes trained ahead to regard a shape that moved against the splash of darkness that gathered around me without mercy. It was that small furry animal. A familiar growl lifted the hairs on my back and made that small animal twitch in the spectre of the light. The barrio. I turned my head and stared into the many shapes of the night. There was nothing that stood out to me. It should not have mattered that I heard any of the barrios. Their cries into the night like emotional wolves seeking their lost parents were a commonality I was used to over these two months. It did not mean I liked it, though, for they kept reminding me of their presence. Maybe I was being delusional, but a part of me always felt like they were subliminally shouting in my ears how I would never escape this planet. That they would hunt me down and catch me eventually. Then again, if I survived this, I was probably going to get immortalized as the man that escaped this planet. The problem was, <laughs> I had to escape. A series of muffled thuds preceded the ruffled vegetation. I flipped my head around to see the animal running off. It barely reached five feet before a growl ripped through the cold night as swiftly as the claws of a predator. I froze in dismay to see the barrio slice into that poor creature and severed its right arm from the rest of its bloody body. My lips parted in surprise, yet I struggled to rationalise this shock that vaulted my insides to the wall. The barrio never came outside at night. My frightful thoughts blasted in my head, but I never moved. The barrio moved, though, and it was towards me. Its body curved with milky white eyes reflecting what little light that cut through the dark atmosphere. The barrio got higher as it moved along what I assumed was the rocky wall in this hilly landscape. I ran. My heart exploded with a burn that overcame my chest down to my lower back. Tripping over shrubs and rocks in a ferocious escape, I dropped into a grass field. Silence. Silence was the only thing I heard as I lay there. Its low growl crept closer to death than any threat in my life. I got up, quickly. My eyes adjusted to my surroundings as I moved my torchlight back and forth. This thing was stalking me, and I could not do anything about it. The spear in my hand did not feel like a weapon of war, more than it did a toothpick. I was so powerless. Surrounded by greenery that should have made me feel peaceful, but instead, it felt like a prison cage. It was not an uncomfortable feeling, because I could go anywhere, but nowhere was a home to me. My mind drifted on those thoughts with a sense of urgency, until my boot slid off something. An ache shot up the length of my ankle when I tumbled. The torchlight passed over white ghosts in my shocked distress. I stepped back and straightened. That's when my heart stopped. The light bathed over rusty and dust-coated surfaces of suits. Many of them were marred and cracked thanks to the claws of those beasts. There were not just any suits. They were protective bodysuits just like mine. Yet they were not exact. Those suits laid along a huge field of scattered trees with some caved-in ditches cutting under the overhanging vines. There were many shapes and sizes. Most of them are white, but there were a few that were of different colours. As far as any emblems or symbols upon them, 
A few had flags from different countries, if not symbols of internal cliques they were a part of. These suits were an odd fixture here, but more than that were who they belonged to. The dangerous thought about my dead teammates cut through my mind with just as much efficiency as it did any other weapons of mass destruction. None of these suits were like mine, so I breathed a sigh of relief to know that these suits did not belong to my teammates. Still, I could not deny that these suits were being held here either as trophies or being used for some functional purpose. There were a lot of suits, and if my rudimentary counting skills were anything to trust, I reasoned there were around 100 suits there. So many people died to these things. On this planet, we were not the predator, but the prey. I knew little about the Barrio. All I knew about them was that they were hungry for meat, and my teammates were that meat. I was the only one left, and I carried the weight of all of them with me. Surviving was not just a personal goal for me. It was the only way to honour all of my past teammates. I realised that now. If I ended up like any of the other suits on this ground, I would have failed them. The rustle of leaves made me turn around. Everything was still, and that terrified me more than anything else. Why did these devils have to sneak around so much? I gritted my teeth and passed my torch's light over the leaves, moss-covered rocks, and the darkness that lurked within. My heart thumped as I stepped back in steady tips on my toes. I avoided stepping on the empty husks of the suits and found myself in an open field with a low foliage of seven-finger leaves. A growl sent my fear flying as I increased my pace. The bottom of my boots creaked to the unsteady rise of the decline. I could not guess what it was, but it was not rock. It was harder and more geometric in shape, but I was too scared to pull my light down. Every moment counted in this place, and I needed to catch that barrio before it got the drop on me. I flicked the light to the side where it touched another ghost, but it was bigger than my imagination could have created. My imagination could not have made this up, for as my light went up, the ghost became bigger, more solid, and more frighteningly similar. A spaceship. It was similar to ours, but looked like something out of a fossil. Vines covered it like they decided that it belonged to this planet. It was theirs, and so would I, if I did not escape this madhouse. Based on the trails on the ground and the ditches surrounding the dump site, opening out to winding tunnels, it was clear that it was dragged here, or carried piece by piece. It was no wonder that these beasts were smart enough to take out the cameras. They knew about our spaceships from experience. What bothered me was how they got all of this experience. There were so many suits and just as many dead people that they belonged to. How did they end up here? I was not sure how many flight campaigns we took to this planet, but it wasn't that many to validate so many remnants of the past. A creak made me jump, but not quick enough as the barrier rushed around a spaceship wing and at my thighs. <laughs> I swung the spear helplessly at the barrier's back. Its claw scratched my suit. If my suit got damaged here, I would be more than dead. I would be in a nightmare. I tried to run, but my foot bashed into a piece of spaceship shielding. My drop into the grass was as unceremonial as it was embarrassing. I pushed myself onto my palms. The barrio's growl purred an unfortunate chill up the length of my spine. Its head with sharp, saliva-dripped teeth passed by me. Those eyes rolled under its narrowed eyelids and regarded me as nothing more than garbage. I was, for both of my hands were empty, and the spear could be anywhere between the scraps of metal, dancing mushrooms and bent blades of grass. Jumping up from my exposed position, I sought refuge. The first sight that gave me any solace was a large chunk of the spaceship. I could hide there, or at least hunker down until I make a plan. The barrio bashed into my side and I fell forward. My chest crashed onto something solid, but there was a punch to the exchange of vibrations between surface to skin. 
I turned around and the barrio scratched into my chest and neck. The barrio glared its glorious incisors and pulled them back in a fierce desire to devour me. I was shaken with terror and froze. A hiss exploded into my left ear as an annoying alarm blasted in my ear in hopes I knew the danger. The warning was never necessary. As my arm pushed into the barrio's neck, it rolled up and over me as its claws tried to grasp for my helmet. I was not losing to any jungle rat as I tried to roll from under this beast. My knee crashed into the stomach of the barrio and it yelped. I spun and jumped up into a run. My heart blasted a drum of mercy and chaos in my mind. I hopped over a large piece of shrapnel and pushed through a narrow section of the ship's wall. The loud thud that followed behind me as I slowed to a stop and looked back at this beast. It snarled and bared its fangs as its outstretched arm tried to claw at me. The barrio could not pass through the narrow passage, but I knew it was a mere nuisance to it. I walked down the debris-laden corridor of what was left of this ship. The walls were mangled and hole-ridden, not big enough to be a threat to me because of a predator, but big enough to compromise this space. I navigated myself over fallen utensils and plastic containers as I reached the edge of a cockpit. The bloodstains worried me. A predator must have gotten inside this spaceship. Could it get to me? I looked behind me and saw nothing but darkness. The growls of the barrio were absent. My wrist lifted the torchlight to reveal the edges of the surrounding corridor and other debris. I stepped back on instinct. How far did I walk? My boots knocked against something hard and I tumbled. I levelled myself and looked down at a communication box. It was pretty strange to see it unlatched from the dashboard, but as I looked around at the damage, a lot of stuff was missing and chaotically thrown about. My chest depressed, yet relaxation grabbed my shoulders. This device could have recordings of this team, just like the box back at my spaceship. I checked to see if the battery was good, and it was. From there, I grabbed one of the chairs and sat on it, and then I pressed play. The crackle of the white noise was a comfort to my ears. January the 14th of 2470. Ben Dawson reporting in on this log. That was the last time I ever felt comfortable. The rest of my voice became nothing more than a drone-like buzz as my brain became cloudy with stress. How was my voice playing right now? From a recorder on a destroyed ship that was similar to mine? That did not make any sense. A thud made me jump up. I looked behind me and flicked the light around at anything that piqued my worries. My voice seeped into my brain like a leaky faucet. The transition was infectious. My words pounded hotter than an iron spike. I shook my head and pushed down the bile of confusion that raised up. My focus on those last words slowed my heart to the edge of falling over the cliff. I talked to them. It's going to be months before they send another rescue mission, and that's if they approve it. I ignored my voice and looked around. What was that soft sound? It sounded like sheets shifting on a rough surface. This still did not make any sense. The rescue ship had not arrived yet. Or did it? I replayed the recording, and that was when I heard the date. That was not possible. I almost had a heart attack the way my heart tried to jump out of my chest. The noises around me faded out as the crackles of the recording settled under my somber words. They crashed. I can't believe this, but I have to keep the faith. Things are hard right now. I have to pick myself up and try to stay out of those barrios' way. It's hard to believe those barrios got to their landing site. It was almost like they knew where they were going to be. I'm starting to think those beasts must be smarter than anything I've seen. I would bet they could be as smart as humans. It's a guess, and I have no proof. 
but it's a feeling I got. A low creak made me look up to my right. The way they move, coordinate their hunts, it's planned. Maybe I'm losing myself since I've been here for so long. I moved the torchlight to reveal what was around me. There was nothing but a large swab of blood stretched up the length of the wall. I talked to them. It's going to be months. The recording drowned out until I swore my heart stopped. I heard nothing as if my body stopped working. Optimism was a strange thing, and it was clear I lost it a long time ago. Surrounded by darkness, with only one light that was battery powered, Stuck on a planet that felt like a prison, and listening to the creaks of a prowling predator. I was lost as much as my confidence. My arms fell away and slacked. I did not care anymore. My hope was on that rescue. I worked all these months toward that eventuality. Would warning them even matter? A long... High-pitched screech was the answer. I did not even lift my light to look around. What might be months could be years, because when I remembered this ruined spaceship had been here all this time, I died inside. I stood there with those encroaching thuds behind me, for I knew my future was darker than the blackest hearts. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's Thomas. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thank you to all our official channel members. Your support means a lot to us. Craving another scary tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time everyone, and remember, stay cosmic.